Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 10th lecture in our series on history and philosophy of science and 20 objects. Those of you who've been filtering into the lecture theater, what you've been watching up on the screen is a machine that models a national economy in flowing water, where the water represents the flow of money through the system, and the tanks on the machine represent the various means by which money is put in or taken out of the system. Now, in the wider world, by which I mean the world beyond Lees, this is known as the Moniac, or sometimes as the Phillips machine, uh, named after one of its inventors, Bill Phillips, you can see here. And the introduction of the machine after the Second World War is widely thought to mark a new era for the ambitions of economics as a science and for the promise of economics uh, models. First of all, to describe the economy, but better than that, to help manage it more wisely, to intervene in it successfully. But at least we don't call it that. We call it the Newland Phillips machine, in honor of Walter Newland, who is the co-inventor of the machine, who's based here at least in economics. It was Walter Newland that got the money uh, from his head of department, Arthur Brown, Department of Economics here at Leeds, which funded the work on the prototype. Uh, the prototype uh, Moniac, the prototype Newland Phillips machine. And it's that machine that we have in our collection. It's one of the gems of our collection. One of the truly famous objects to do with the history of science as it unfolded here in Leeds. It's a rather large object, too large for us to bring into the lecture theater. We hope that after the lecture, after we've had a discussion, uh, you'll join us for mince pies and mulled wine over at the business school, where there's a really fine display of the machine and some art that we'll introduce you to later on as well. Now, economics as a science is a little different than the sciences that we've looked at in the course of these lectures so far. I've got here the nine objects that have been at the center of, uh, of our lectures, from the Cypriot horse and rider, fourth century BC, the very first lecture, right on through uh, a few weeks ago to the anthrax finger. And if you take any one of them almost at random, if we think about the tuning forks, uh, as objects of inquiry, it's, it's relatively straightforward to think how uh, physical acoustics, like right, the science uh, connected with the tuning forks, how would one go about studying that? What one would observe? What one would measure? What kinds of questions to ask? Where to start and where to go from there? By contrast, with the economy, where do you go to have a look? There's no one thing to look at. There's no obvious focus for economic inquiry. Lots of things seem to matter. I've got here a picture of people buying and selling in one of the famous markets in Leeds. But that's just a small sample. A huge number of puzzles around economics as a science, the role that models play in the science, and even little games like the ones that I hope some of you had a chance to play uh, while you were preparing for this lecture. And quite what the meaning of uh, the ultimatum game is for our lecture will be revealed a bit later on. So it's going to be a lecture about models, about maths, and about money. And there are three of us, uh, appropriately enough, to help undertake the task. First of all, uh, Stephen French. Uh, professor of Philosophy of Science here at Leeds is going to give you an introduction to models in science from physics through to economics. He's then going to turn to Dr. Mike Finn, who is the director of our museum in the history of science, technology, and medicine. And he's going to talk about the machine uh, in particular, about its origins and about its later career. And though we don't have the machine here, we do have a piece. Uh, you'll see that plastic uh, tank, Perspex tank at the front. That's a bit of original Newland Phillips machine. Uh, Mike will be saying a little bit more about that. So we do have its presence in the room a little bit. And then finally, I'll be coming back uh, around the middle of the lecture to provide longer, larger perspectives, historical and philosophical. Historically, I want to trace the links between money and models and maths right back to the beginning of quantitative economic science, and then take the story forward even into the future, and what I regard as some interesting new insights into the role of models in what are sometimes called the human sciences, the sciences to do with us as objects of scientific inquiry. 
So that's where we're going over the course of the evening. Uh, if you could now just join me in welcoming Steve French to get us started. So, uh, thanks Greg, that's great. Um, typically, do you ask, okay, science, what does science produce? Let's stand over here, right. Um, what does science produce? You might think, well, two things really. Um, interesting theories and uh, new observations, new experiments. But over the last 50 years or so, uh, philosophers of science, uh, sociologists of science, historians of science have come to appreciate that Science is also concerned, scientists are also concerned with developing something else, models. Okay? This is something that became apparent to many philosophers of science well, through the 1960s, and there's now really a whole kind of cottage industry looking at uh, models in science. What kinds of models? The obvious question, what kinds of models and uh, what do they do? Now here's some two very different uh, Kinds, one, uh, I think that, that, that Watson Crick, I would say Crick Watson, Watson Crick, and the famous uh, DNA model. That's a physical model built out of bits of um, I think tin plate and, and uh, uh, steel. Um, here we have uh, not the models themselves, but the outputs of certain models, climate change models. And this is an area where actually fossils of science. <coughs> Um, have had some input into some of the considerations about climate change models. Uh, colleagues, Roman Frigg at the LSC, Charlotte Berndl now at uh, Salzburg, and Katie Steele also at the LSC, have been looking at climate change models, their robustness, um, how they're constructed, and that's actually fed into some of the, the reports uh, about these different models. And we have some models uh, here at the museum, some of them here at the table you can look at. I think that's supposed to be a model of uh, protein. Um, that's a model of God knows what, but it's something <laughs> biological, so I don't have anything much to do with that. Um, <clears throat> some of these models are actually quite intricate, quite delicate, made of wax or, or plastic, um, used for pedagogical purposes quite often, and for many years, uh, models and modeling uh, certainly from the philosophical perspective, was dismissed as, uh, at best, of pedagogical interest. And it wasn't really, as I said, until the 1960s that people began to appreciate that scientists use these models for other purposes, as the previous slide hopefully indicated. So there's a huge diversity of models, and the Phillips uh, Newman machine is uh, another one, a physical model, uh, but obviously quite different in both kind and purpose to the DNA model, for example. Okay, what are the roles played by models in science? Actually, there's a, a, a similar diversity in roles. I'm only going to mention two such roles here, um, the two of the most discussed roles. One is that they play an important role in scientific discovery. We'll talk a little bit about that. And the other is uh, they have a role as mediators. It's a kind of buzzword <coughs> that's used uh, in these considerations. And I'll explain a little bit about that. But, let, but let's consider the role of models in scientific discovery. First, an obvious example. Uh, I couldn't get an image of billiard balls. I mean, what is this country coming to? <laughs> of billiard balls? So anyway, pool ball. The billiard ball model of a gas. You uh, go back to the kinetic theory of, of gases, um, and you model the gas as a you know, bunch of very hard spheres um, bouncing around a container. And you can explain you know, various relationships, how the pressure goes up when you reduce the volume. Right? Pressure understood in terms of average number of impacts on the, on the walls of the container and so on. Um, a very useful model for helping to get a grip on the kinetic theory of gases. And then, but there's more that we can say about it. We can say that this model acts as a kind of analogy. The billiard balls are analogues of gas atoms. And someone who wrote a lot about analogies and models and analog models was Professor Mary Hesse, um, 
recently uh, died a couple of months ago. Um, she started off here at Leeds as a mathematics lecturer. She was instrumental in bringing together what became the Division of History and Philosophy of Science, now the Centre for History and Philosophy of Science here at Leeds. She went on in the late 50s to a position in what is now the Science and Technology Studies Unit at UCL before moving to Cambridge, eventually becoming professor. Uh, she's a figure that really spans the sort of history, 20th century of, of the discipline of history and philosophy of science. She was, I think, vice president of the British Society for the History of Science. She was president of the American Philosophy of Science Association. She was editor of the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, the best journal in the field, by the way. And she wrote on numerous topics. She was a, a, a great believer in what we now call uh, what we now call integrated history and philosophy of science, bringing the history and the philosophy of science together in the way that these talks, these twenty objects talks, are trying to do. But in particular, she wrote this book, Models and Analogies in Science, in 1963. It's still cited. And not just as, oh yeah, that old book by Mary Hetty, it's still cited as a live resource uh, today. We just recently, in our reading group, read a paper on the use of certain kinds of hydrodynamic models as analogies to uh, uh, black holes, which sounds you know, quite uh, astonishing. I think this was actually used as an episode on Big Bang Theory, one of my favorite TV shows. Um, and that paper referred to Hesse's pioneering work in this area. It's quite a rich analysis that she gives of models, but putting it very crudely, she breaks the analogy down into three parts. There's a positive analogy. Right? So there's a positive analogy between the billiard balls and the gas atom. Right? The billiard balls are massy. They, they're hard. Perhaps not infinitely hard, but very hard. They obey Newtonian mechanics. There's a negative analogy where the analogy falls down. Gas atoms are not colored. They don't have numbers on them. Okay? But then she said there's something else, and this is what, what's really interesting about her work, there's something she called the neutral analogy. Properties of billiard balls, perhaps, we don't know whether they, or we don't, didn't know at the time, whether they apply to gas atoms. So you can put a spin on a billiard ball. You can you know, make it curve. Do gas atoms spin? Do they have rotational degrees of freedom? Exploring that neutral analogy is where all the kind of heuristic fertility of models, she claimed, where all the heuristic fertility lies. And that's how models become useful in discovery. It's by exploring the neutral analogy in these kinds of cases that you can extend the model. And you can discover that actually you know, gas atoms behave like this. You can extend, extend the theory. So that's one. There's a lot more to be said about that, but that's one role of uh, uh, models in science. The second one, models act as mediators. What does that mean? Well, it's an idea that goes back to uh, Margie Morrison, which is still at the University of Toronto. Um, and her idea was um, a simple one, but a really interesting one. Models often mediate between theories and experiments. You may have a theory, and it's just too complicated to get any meaningful predictions out of it. You have to make certain idealizations. You have to make certain idealizing assumptions, certain approximations. You have to alter the theory in various ways, perhaps to make it computationally tractable, so you can use it to make predictions. When you're doing that, you're basically constructing a model of the theory. It's not all top down. Some of your previous experimental work may have to feed into that model, uh, feed into those idealizations. And then interestingly, Morrison uh, argues, using a number of, uh, of uh, case studies, that these models can then take on a life of their own. So actually, scientific attention turns away from the theory to the models, which, as she puts it, become functionally autonomous from the theory. Okay. There where all the knowledge claim resides. There where all the interesting practice is undertaken. So here's, here's an example uh, that perhaps leads into the object that we've chosen for tonight. So think about you know, uh, the great banking crisis. What's, what was the cause? 
it rampant capitalism? Was it, go and watch your pronunciation here, a bunch of bankers? <laughs> or, I've taken this from a, a, an article by Ian Stewart, a mathematician at the University of Warwick, was it a model? Right? We know now, I think, you know, there's been various, there's even been movies about the great banking crisis of 2007, 2008, but we know from those studies that now well, I think we're all aware of this, that bankers and financial experts and others used models to try and model the economy in various ways. And here's one of them, called the Black Scholes model. Sometimes I think it's called the Black Scholes uh, Merton. Um, um, Scott Scholes and Merton got the Nobel Prize for it. Black didn't, as I recall, because he was dead. You don't get the Nobel Prize after you die. Um, and the idea is this, um, and I'm not an economist, so this is, you know, don't question me on this stuff. Um, but the idea is as follows, um, I produce wheat, okay? Mike wants wheat, but not right now, in six months. He wants a thousand metric tons of wheat. So I say, cool, let's make a contract. I'll give you an option to buy a thousand metric tons of wheat in six months at the knockdown price of 141 American dollars. Check before I came here. That is the current price of red winter wheat. I don't know what red winter wheat is, I don't know why it's there. But that's, we, we've agreed this. He has the option. Four months down the line, Mike decides wheat is passe. Barley is where it's at. He's not interested in wheat so much. I want, I want to get some barley options, he says. But he's got this option. What's he going to do with it? Well, Graham says, you know, I'm a bit of a wheat man. I wouldn't mind getting me, me some of that wheat. I'll take your option. What, at what price is Mike going to sell this option to Graham? I don't care. I'm still selling my thousand metric tons of wheat at that price. I've got my you know, money pretty much in the bank. Graham really wants to know, okay, what am I going to have to pay for this option? There's a lot more to it than that. Um, we're very close to the business school, so I'm kind of nervous about what I say <laughs> about this stuff. But this model, oh look, it's all maths, God. This model helps uh, in, uh, well, gauging the relevant price uh, that Graham should pay uh, for such an, uh, such an option. Uh, and it allows options to be sold at any time. Okay, so you, you, at any time after they've been, you, you, you've agreed one, you know, months down the line, you can you know, sell them on. And one of the reasons for the banking crisis is, um, I mean, this, this is a form of derivative, right? It's kind of like a second order thing. We're not so much interested now in the selling of wheat. I'm interested in the selling of wheat. I'm a simple man, simple wheat man, right? These guys are now involved in something else, something at the next level up, the selling of something about wheat. And this led to, or had, continues to lead to, uh, rampant speculation. Obviously, you know, Mike wants to buy that option at a low price and sell it to Graham at a high price. So Mike makes money not out of selling wheat, I make money out of selling wheat, I'm the honest farmer. He's the dodgy finance guy making money out of selling options on wheat. Sorry. Um, obviously it depends on the volatility of the market value of the, com of the commodity, how the price uh, changes. And there's a crucial idealization that is made in his model that the volatility, the volatility kind of measures how the price kind of goes up and down. The volatility remains constant over the lifetime of the option. Right? The black Scholes model just makes that as an idealizing assumption. Right? In general, economic models make lots of assumptions, like that people behave rationally. Ha ha, they don't. Right? That's a big idealization that, that got thrown out. Of as Ian, Ian uh, Stewart said, any mathematical model of reality relies on simplifications and assumptions. That's kind of what makes it a model. Um, the Black Scholes equation was based on arbitrage pricing theory in which both drift and volatility are constant. This assumption is common in financial theory, but it's often false for real market. And it makes various other assumptions. Again, reality is often very different. In these kinds of cases, the idealizations that 
modelers make can have real world consequences. And I think this economic example is a nice case study of what Morrison was talking about. There was so much attention focused on the model, right? It became so autonomous that people lost sight of the idealizations that had been made. And when the subprime market blew up, the whole thing came crashing down and we're still living with the consequences. Okay. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, that's me looking at the value of my pension. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think let's hand over to Mike. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, so um, we see from Stephen's examples that models are widespread in the natural sciences and the social sciences, and in economics too. And as Stephen said, they've been implicated in the financial crash um, of the last decade because they oversimplify, they, they miss out key details, um, and because there's a sense that the financial system, markets, the bankers, governments, all slavishly follow models even if they don't fit or they don't look beyond uh, what the models are modeling. Um, even when evidence seems to contradict them or, or there's, there's common sense which suggests something's going wrong. And this is a story that the, the way it's often reported, certainly in the last five, ten years, um, as something that sort of has its origins back in maybe the late 70s and 80s and the story of um, growth of rapid computerized systems and particular <coughs> models um, or ideals for the running of national and multinational economies um, are implicated in, in this crash. I, but I think to understand the way models have become a part of economics, we, we can and should go further back than that, to the time after the Second World War. Um, and to the history of today's object, which is a 67-year-old contraction knocked together in a garage um, that we call the new Phillips machine. Yeah. This was my picture. That's, that's one of the bankers. Um, so if we go back to the 1940s, and economics wasn't particularly a mathematical science, but a mixture of verbal and mathematical descriptions. Um, the dominant ideas of the time in Britain at least, uh, were from this man, John Maynard Keynes. He died in 1946, and he was never actual time person of the year, uh, which is a topic about the moment, right? Um, but in the year of the picture, which is 1965, um, so some 20, 20 years after his death, was the year where the baby boomer generation were the person of the year. Um, and time announced that we're all Keynesian. Um, so Keynes' ideas developed in response to the Great Depression of the 1930s, and in contradiction to the classical ideas of economics, of Ricardo and others, he, um, Keynes says that economic markets aren't perfect and self-sustaining, uh, but they can stagnate, they can cause unemployment, and sometimes the government should step in and correct them, or provide, provide when demand falls. So he, as he suggested, there's a flaw around an economy, um, which should be understood through a mixture of some mathematical, calc geometrical calculations and, and graphs, but like I said, a more literary verbal description um, of how things work. That's how he, he describes his economic theories. But the, these mixtures of, of descriptions and some maths don't really capture the kind of the flowing sort of dynamic sense of what an economy is. Really they, they are sort of static calculations of moments in time and you have to sort of assume what happens in between them. Um, so the, 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 the maths isn't quite sort of sophisticated enough to, to keep up with his idea of how an economy works. So to, to kind of get a grip on these issues, in 1949, two economists, Bill Phillips and Walter Newman, um, set about building a machine that could better capture the Keynesian model, as they saw it. So uh, here's Bill Phillips on the left, 
and Walter Newlin on the right, and in the middle is First Langley, who was Bill's landlord down in London. So Bill was a New Zealander who uh, served as an engineer during the Second World War, and on, on his return, he went and studied at the OSC, uh, majoring in sociology with a side in economics. And he said, he admitted, he struggled with economics at the time. He kind of, certain things in, in Keynesian theories didn't quite make sense to him. Keynesian monetary theory, um, he couldn't quite see how it fitted together. And as a result, well, possibly as a result, he only just scraped through with a sort of basic pass in his degree. Uh, Walter, on the other hand, he was only a year ahead of Bill, but straight out of his degree, he'd come to Leeds and got a job as a lecturer in economics. Hit the point up here. Um, <laughs> so, no, no. So, uh, and so they had Walter's economic understanding, Bill's engineering skills, and then a hundred pound donation from the University of Leeds to build a machine that modelled an economy using water to represent the flow of money. And it wasn't just a simple case of translating sort of, the mathematical models into sort of, physical components in a machine, because the mathematical models weren't dynamic, they couldn't work that way. Um, so what Phillips and Newlin had to do was kind of take their understanding and, and read through Keynesian ideas and try and interpret them and translate them and make sense of them. So it's a process of trial and error building a machine um, that seems to model the economy. So what they build is a hydraulic analog computer. So water um, literally represents money flowing down through an economy. Um, here we have yeah, the picture on the left hand side of the prototype. Um, they, you, in the video you'll have seen at the beginning, they, to make it sort of more visible what's going on, they used to dye the water red. Um, but the dye literally corroded the machine, so that money corroded the system as it went around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Money flows down and, and, and different factors such as taxation, savings and imports can be altered and their effect on the economy, on the national economy, is, is seen and can be charted across time. Um, so, as you said, we'll, we'll hopefully some of you will join us to come and have a look at this after the lecture. Um, but it's a machine that's made out of metal, perspex, some glass, um, whatever they could get their hands on. Um, at the bottom is a pump from a Lancaster bomber, which pumps water to the top of the machine, um, and then gravity does the rest. So water enters the top of the machine <coughs> here, here, there, um, here, as disposable, uh, uh, sorry, as income. Um, immediately, the first thing that happens is Big chunk of water is siphoned off, as always, for taxation. Can't escape that. Then, from what's left, savings come out, too. Um, and the savings, so personal savings, might then, you can sort of see here, um, filter off into separate bank balances. Uh, the rate that people save up can be was one of the things that can be altered. And this, this was the original piece that kind of, you moved backwards and forwards to, to affect that, which is the liquidity preference function. <coughs> so a key aspect of Keynesian economics. Um, so what that leaves behind then is consumption spending, to which then government investment and personal investments um, add back to that central floor of water again. That leaves behind domestic spending. Um, from that point, water is again siphoned off, money leaves the system for imports, and then money, water enters the system again through exports. Um, and at the end, 
what's left, everything goes back down to transaction, but active transaction balances, um, ready to start the whole process again. So all of these things can be changed. The rate of government taxation and spending, people's preference for saving and investment. The, the foreign exchange rate can be um, adapted to, to see how that affects the system. They even build um, a kind of a mirror image model so that you can plug two, two machines together and see how two different national economies, the one they're primarily, the two they're primarily interested in being British and American, how decisions made in one can affect what happens in the other. So just because the yeah, rate of um, government taxation in America that could affect lots of different things over in Britain. Um, and all of these things can then be plotted on a graph and charted across time to see how they change all the time. Now, Bill and Walter demonstrated the machine in 1949 at the LSE, and it was a great success. This is Bill on the left-hand side here, um, always with a cigarette in hand. Um, it's what killed him in the end. He died quite young of cancer, but he was a chain smoker. Uh, <coughs> their demonstration was a great success, and so with James Mead, who later became a Nobel Prize winner in economics, Bill set about developing the machine to create the Mark II model. So what we have is the Mark I prototype. Um, and the Mark II model became more refined and accurate um, by, by, with a little bit more expertise. And they found that once they played around with it, they had a system that seemed to be able to reflect a real economy to within plus or minus 2% accuracy. So it, although it was meant to just demonstrate, it actually was very accurate in the calculations it could be. Um, it helped, so Bill, uh, it helped Bill get a job. So because of the success of the second model, he was employed as um, a lecturer at the LSE because the, the model seemed such a good thing for teaching undergraduate economists. Um, so that was so. Sort of in 1950, he gets it done. Uh, Walter returned back up to Leeds, and um, he became in time professor of economics here and a world-renowned economist, expert in African financial theory, African finances. Um, he published in 1962 his, his influential theory of money book, and also was a philanthropist in the area, contributing to lots of local projects. So Walter Newland was quite influential in the building of the West Yorkshire Playhouse on the other side of the city. Um, so as well as him coming back, the prototype came back with him, because, well, we paid for it. And uh, it remained in use in teaching in Leeds for about 20, 25 years, until the late 70s. So we call it a new and first machine, as Greg said. But to the rest of the world, it's referred to as the Mornia. Um, which stands for Monetary National Income Analog Computer. The MO is both in monetary. I didn't think like that one. So, <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, the reason that it's called money, partly because, well, I assume because it sounds a bit like Minia, um, but also because it's an allusion to um, Enia, which is the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, which is generally seen as the world's first general purpose electronic computer, which started operation in Philadelphia in 1946. And at the same time that Bill and Walter were developing the, the Moniac machine in London, um, up in Manchester they were developing the Mark I Manchester Model Baby computer. Um, at the Victoria University. Um, so computing is in the air. The, the project, the baby computer at Manchester, the project was led by Alan Turing. Um, so the scientist who as well as helping to sort of decode the Enigma machine was also the father of theoretical computing. 
and, and who first proposed the idea of a universal computing machine. So this is the era of the birth of computing, of, of digital computing. And so it's in that context of, of the rise of computers that we should see the money at, I think, that, that people are thinking computers can help us to solve problems, to model things, to, to crack codes. Um, but what's interesting about the, the Moniac, the new and first machine, is it's not really like other computers. So, for one, it's not digital, it's analog. There's not a, a flow of binary digits represented by kind of electronic valves, vacuum tubes. It's water. The other thing is, it's not standardly like a computer in that for most computers we think of as a black box into which we put an input and get an output. Um, but we don't necessarily see the workings. Whereas the whole point of the Moniac new and first machine is the workings is the bit we're interested in. Seeing how it sort of flows around on the way down is what tells us something. So it's an interesting question whether it is a computer or not. Um, and it's an influential machine in lots of ways. So it's thought that around 14 of the Mark II models were made. I think that's the, what people think of it. And these found their way to various universities, banks, corporations around the world. Um, so places that, that bought up a, one of the Mark II models included Harvard University, the Ford Motor Company, the Central Bank of Guatemala. People, they thought that this thing was useful to have this thing. And on the basis of, of what he learned from developing the machine, Bill Phillips, also developed the Phillips curve, as it came to be known. Um, so in a 1958 paper, a few years later, when he examined the relation between unemployment and the rate of change of money wage rates in the United Kingdom, 1861 to 1957. So um, he looked at the historical relationship between unemployment and inflation, with uh, rates of wage increase. Um, and he found that as throughout history, as unemployment fell, um, inflation rose. Now it's said that as a as a Keynesian, his belief was this this relationship um, was something that kind of maybe that's what seemed to happen naturally, but the role of government was to step in when unemployment did rise and not just say, oh well, we, we'll have to use unemployment to control the rate of inflation or vice versa. Um, but to try and find a way to gain full employment whilst keeping a steady level of inflation. Um, the rise of stagflation in the 1970s and would, would seem to contradict his ideas when, when we have kind of stagnation of wages and inflation at the same time, which um, Friedman well, said that actually Phillips was right when his model was only in the short term, in the long term it all balances out again anyway. So, something that's still used, the Phillips curve is being modified a lot today, and it's, it's not quite seen exactly as Phillips saw it, but it's still an important and useful contribution to economics. The machine has kind of always attracted attention since it was first built as well. So, from newspaper writers, um, Yorkshire Evening Post in 1950 when it first came out, um, spending money like water. Um, <laughs> in 65, the Daily Mail, um, so the year that sort of the baby boomers were becoming a thing and they were all talking about keen, they looked back at the machine again. Um, and in the last two months, there's been <coughs> lots of newspaper articles about the ammonia because um, there's a version at the Science Museum in London and they've just got reopened their galleries and so people keep pointing out that this, this machine is the, is the highlight of the collection. I think it's part of the kind of donation of the object to the science museum that it has to be on permanent display. So it, it gets talked about a lot. And um, what, when newspapers and, and media talk about the Moniac, they tend to think of it as, and describe it in terms of a, a Heath Robinson machine, um, made of all bits and bobs, things stuck together. And the reason for that, I think, is largely because 
1953, not long after the machine was made public, Emmett in Punch Cartoon put together this sort of famous image of an economy modeled in, in a Heath Robinson style where kind of, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, um, money is represented by cold tea. <laughs> um, and you can see here, there's a, a little man who's making the daily grind to turn the machine around. Um, and instead of coming all the way back down to active balances, it all goes down the drain. So the idea that it's kind of a bit of a joke machine, using water to model economy, um, made out of bits and bobs that lying around, has stuck. Um, and that idea has played on a bit, so Walter's Dalter, who's a sculptor, made um, this sculpture called The Econocost in light of uh, the financial crisis of 2007 onwards, which is on display next to the, the real thing as well, so you can go and see that down there. Um, and for many people, I think the place where most people have come across the Moniac, or a machine that uses um, water to model an economy, is in Terry Pratchett's novel, in Making Money in particular. Uh, so, in the novel, uh, in, in this world, I'm not a Terry Pratchett fan, but I'm told about this. Um, the, the fractional reserve banking system is, is put in place on this world. And the Wizards of the Unseen University develop a water driven computer to model the economy. Um, and it's sort, of, it's, it's sort of doesn't quite work, but it's no worse than kind of the normal computers. Uh, the, the, the central character, which um, I don't know if he's a play on the water machine, but it's called Moist von Liquid. Um, so it, it's all very kind of humorous and it's funny machine, but also it's had a really important role in educating um, a generation of economists since um, the 1950s. So there's a clip from a video, um, which is from an Adam Peirce documentary, so you can imagine quite a kind of subversive alternative view of the machine, which that it's sort of seen that, well, um, what happened after the 1950s, that a generation of mostly London-based economists were educated in economics with this machine, um, which shows you what happens when you manipulate different parts of an economy. You can predict when you do this, you change that exchange rate, you do this, it will have some specific outcome. And it kind of encouraged, some people believe, um, an economic view that you can try and manipulate the system to get things out of it that you want. So a move away from the old civil service idea of just keep the economy stable, let's just keep things ticking along, to the idea of a planned economy, we can try and create the conditions we want, which, led, which has led to problems since that time. Um, whether that's, so that's one way of looking at it. Um, so having looked at the creation of a, a particular kind of economic model, um, we're going to now look back a bit further and deeper still into the most fundamental of kind of human activity <coughs> and how those have been modeled. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. So, so far we've uh, had Stephen on models in general. And if we stopped the lecture there, uh, we would have, I think, inadvertently left you with the impression that these links that we're tracing between uh, models and maths uh, and money, and uh, the further relation as well with these cycles of stability and crisis, that all of that kind of dates from about the 1970s, 80s, into the 90s through the banking crisis. Uh, in the second part of the lecture, though, with Mike Finn's focus on the Newland Phillips machine, you see that those trace much further back to uh, at least the post-Second World War period. And I think the, we've seen the Newland Phillips machine is, is a really useful object to think with in trying to track how economics itself changes after the post-war period and how it's changed the world, or helped to change the world in that period. I now want to track it back even further right, in my view, to the very beginnings of economics as a quantitative science. Uh, that'll be the more historical part of what I'm about to say. I then want to turn toward the very end to make some more philosophical points about the nature of models, 
and whether there might be a deep and interesting difference between models uh, in the natural sciences and models in the social, or let's call them the human sciences. But first, the historical uh, part. I trace these back, along with others, to Thomas Robert Malthus. Robert's and his friends, born in 1766, died in 1834. He studied maths at Cambridge, uh, then he became an Anglican clergyman. But we remember him, the world remembers him, and much of the world reviles him for his 1798 book, Essay on the Principle of Population. It was published anonymously, caused a tremendous controversy, uh, and uh, it became Malthus's life work to put out ever larger, more thoughtful, better evidence editions, uh, six altogether in the course of his lifetime. It was because of Malthus that economics got dubbed the dismal science by Thomas Carlyle. And that's because of the essay. So what does he say in that book? So the year is 1798. Uh, it's a response on Malthus's part to the French Revolution, which uh, was talked about in Sean Dyde's lecture a couple of months ago. From 1789, those enormous changes in France made in the name of a vision of the perfectibility of man. Things could be different. Throw off the monarchy, throw off the shackles of tradition, start again. Our metric system is uh, a living legacy of that moment when you could put the past away, start afresh in the name of reason, and bring illimitable progress uh, to our lives. Well, Malthus thought, no, that's not how it's going to work. And his essay is a repudiation of the ideologues of the French Revolution, both in France and in Britain. It has a lovely 18th century long title that's worth reading. Right? An essay on the principle of population as it affects the future improvement of society with remarks on the speculations of Mr. Godwin, Monsieur Condorcet, and other writers. Uh, Godwin is the most instructive one for our purposes, an English radical who was arguing that if only uh, England would get rid of the monarchy, get rid of private property, uh, in a short time, a kind of anarchist utopia could be ours. Malthus thought those ideas were not just wrong, but dangerous. And he meant his essay to show why. So what is the principle of population? At the bottom, it's really very simple. It says something in some ways so obvious that you wonder why anyone needed to say it. You put it like this, that the means of subsistence available in a place, i.e. how much food there is, limits the number of people who can live there. That's the principle in a nutshell. That basic point wasn't itself new. As I say, it's too obvious to have been a kind of a discovery uh, at the end of the 18th century. But what's new is how far Malthus pushed it. He gave it quantitative expression in a very, uh, uh, a very consequential way, and he carried out a new level of social and moral analysis around it. Now, the book is uh, very much of the style that Mike was uh, talking about in connection with Keynes. It, it, it is a book. It's a book to be read. There's no equations in that book. It's nevertheless the case that Malthus's central claim was quantitative. You can state it like this. Other things being equal, subsistence increases arithmetically, and population increases geometrically. So what that tells you is that as subsistence increases, one, one, two, three, four, population increases, one, two, four, eight. It goes, it very quickly outstrips subsistence. So what happens, Malthus asks, when there are more people than can be fed, because that's going to happen. If population moves that fast relative to subsistence. Or to, in Malthus's 18th century terms, he talks about the two powers, the Earth's productive powers and the human reproductive powers. So there are two powers which are brought out of balance. Then there, there has to be a rebalancing. How does that work? And they're brought into balance, he says, by a number of checks to population. Population has got too big, it has to get smaller. How does that happen? He says there are two kinds of checks. First, there are what he calls positive checks, which is a very 
a uh, misleading uh, term from our point of view because they're not in any way happy. Uh, they're positive in the sense of being active. There's an active calling back of the population. People are killed. People are killed through famine and they're killed through war. Right? So an active pruning back of, of an overlarge population. That's one means of rebalancing. The other kinds of checks he calls preventive. So you can, you can have people who are already alive got rid of, or you can not bring into being people who might otherwise come into being. That's a preventive check. And delayed marriage for Malthus in his time is the means. If, if marriage is delayed, fewer children are had. And so in the short term, balance is restored. The two powers, productive and reproductive, are brought back into balance, but at a terrible price in misery and vice. Calamity is guaranteed on the Malthusian vision. So there's little prospect for human perfectibility, as against Godwin, as against Condorcet. Make a few further comments. What kind of a vision is this? It's a vision of oscillations between feast and famine, humans trapped in a kind of a cycle. Nevertheless, Malthus says, there is an arrow of progress. Things are getting better. He allowed, for example, and how could he not, especially in the 18th century, the age of improvement, that better methods in farming would allow for progress. The progress would be slow, it would be halting, but it would, be, it would happen. So you get oscillations, but they're oscillations with the trajectory. Now, an interesting question. Remember, I said that he's a clergyman. What kind of a god would have doomed humans to calamity just by doing what comes naturally. In some ways, this is, it remains a, sur <clears throat> a surprising book to come from a man of the cloth. <clears throat> well, Malthus had an answer that he put at the uh, end of his first edition. He took it out of later editions. But in the first edition, he explains that the reason we're built like this is that God has a kind of cruel-to-be-kind logic. Uh, uh, and if God had built us so that we could have sat around in the Garden of Eden, pl uh, Garden of Eden plucking fruits uh, without having to work our faculties. We would never have developed the arts of civilizations. We would never have developed our God-given capacities for reason. Uh, it was only because we were forced onto our resources, because there wasn't enough food to go around, that we've developed as uh, a species in the way that we have and in the way that God wants. So it, there is a kind of logic at work, but it's a cruel-to-be-kind logic. Now, I find it useful, uh, thinking about the larger perspective on models that Stephen introduced us to, to think about models in connection with Malthus's claims. I don't think Malthus' Malthus's claims are well thought of as answering directly to the world. Is Malthus correct? Should we just go and have a look? I don't think it's that kind of uh, a statement. Uh, and the clue there is in that phrase, other things being equal. That's a clue that you're dealing with an idealization, an analogy, a model. A way to think about it is that what Malthusian theory does is that it defines a model population. And you might say that a Malthusian population is a population undergoing Malthusian expansion. And then the question you ask when you go out into the world is whether or not any particular real population is Malthusian, or to what degree it's Malthusian, and in what ways it's Malthusian, and why it is, and why it isn't. It energizes inquiry, but it's not something that's straightforwardly checked as true or false. So that's a, a charitable way, and I think a correct way, of thinking about Malthus's achievement. But not everybody has been inclined to be charitable uh, about Malthus uh, from the time that he published in 1798, right on through to our days, Malthus has been a hate figure among the left especially. Not all of the left. There has always been a Malthusian left and an anti-Malthusian left. But what do they hate? People who hate Malthus. He was apparently a very sweet guy. All of his friends adored him. Um, well, one thing they hate about him is that they see Malthusian theory as naturalizing human inequality, as preaching the message that poverty and misery are our natural lot. It's part of the laws of nature. There's nothing you can do about it. So stop moaning. The poor law in England was changed in the 1830s in ways that made it deliberately harsher. Uh, we're familiar with this from Charles Dickens. Uh, the, the, the making of 
of poor houses, as awful as they were, was something done in Malthus's name. Not just Malthus's, there were other people who wanted it. And, and it represented the kind of importation of that cruel to be kind logic from God's domain to the human domain. It was in the interest of all for the poorest people to be made as uncomfortable as possible in their poverty, so that they wouldn't themselves then have too many children and bring disaster not just on themselves but on the rest of us. By making the poor houses so awful, they would learn the habits of delayed marriage, of civilized life. Uh, and it would be good for them and it would be good for the rest of us. Now one of the many people who was paying attention in the course of the debates over the reform of the poor law in the 1830s was young Charles Darwin. He was being sent literature about this debate while he was on the Beagle voyage. And when Darwin came back from the Beagle, famously, he persuaded himself that the transmutation of species was correct and was working out his own theories. And in the autumn of 1838, he reads Malthus. And out of that reading, not instantly, but over a range of months, comes his theory of natural selection. And it is a Malthusian theory to its core. And it's a theory that's based on a model as well, also an analogy, and in a quite important way. Because Darwin systematically compares what happens on a farm, when a breeder is present, with what happens in nature. On a farm, the breeder will select the individuals who happen to be born in ways that make them most like the character the breeder's interested in, in the case of cows, uh, higher milk yield, uh, better meat, whatever it might be. Everyone, every other individual is, is killed, the select individuals are allowed to breed, and the breeder hopes their offspring will have those features that make them uh, uh, so attractive. <clears throat> and over the generations, the breeder will breed into being a new variety. Well, Darwin says something like that happens in nature too, but nature is much more powerful than humans. And what does the selecting is not a breeder, but the struggle for existence, the Malthusian struggle for existence acts as the filter. It's the Malthusian struggle that filters out all but the individuals who are best adapted to their conditions of life. And as their offspring inherit their winning-making features, over time you get not just new varieties, but new species. And Darwin himself said, this is the doctrine of Malthus applied with manifold force to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms. Again, the left is not always pleased about this. Marx thought Darwin was brilliant, but Malthus was a kind of bourgeois creep uh, the, the uh, Marxian uh, sociologists have long regretted uh, that uh, Darwin, who gave a natural basis to the class struggle, should nevertheless have fallen for Malthus. And there's a job of work to try to dissociate Darwin from Malthus. Through the 19th century, the debate continues. Into the 1890s, William Morris, who we tend to think of nowadays as having made wallpaper, uh, but who, of course, was much more important than that as a, as a radical uh, thinker and uh, artisan and artist, uh, publishes a book called News from Nowhere, which is a utopian vision uh, repudiating Malthus, showing that if only humans would recover their innate cooperativeness, they would find that if there wasn't a struggle. The notion of a struggle was an ideological fiction. And we would very quickly find ourselves living in an epoch of rest, having to do only a, a, a little bit of work each day to satisfy our needs. Against that, H.G. Wells, young H.G. Wells, there in London at the time, a student of Thomas Huxley, uh, Darwin's bulldog, publishes The Time Machine. And The Time Machine is a satire on Morris's news from nowhere. What happens when you reduce Malthusian pressure from humankind? In Wells' vision, it's a nightmare. You get a corrupted, biologically corrupted species. That's what happens. If we flash forward, uh, a century to uh, uh, 1998, 200 years after Malthus published. We got a book called Beyond Malthus, which comes out of uh, the Malthusian left in our time, uh, which is often part of the sustainable development world. And they say, yes, of course, it's the case that the world hasn't collapsed yet from population, but, 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 maybe at last the Earth is reaching its carrying capacity. How much further can there be? Just as Stephen checked the price of wheat uh, before his lecture, I checked how many people there are. And there are seven and a half billion people at last count. Now seven and a half billion to one. 
Um, <laughs> now, uh, in the light of the concerns of the sustainability development movement about the impact that we have through our economic activity on the earth, and asking themselves whether we might do it differently. Are there ways of growing our economies without ruining the earth? Uh, one of the most interesting ideas I ever heard on this front was from the guy you see in, uh, in the, the tie there at the bottom, Giuseppe Fontana, a uh, professor here in the business school. This is from an event uh, that uh, our HPS group held uh, around the Newland machine shortly after we uh, got the museum going. This was in 2009. You see my colleague Adrian Wilson there. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's here as well. It was a, a terrific event. And I, I, as I'm strolling down memory lane, I, I just want to show you another photo from that same event. Because one of the things that we all cherish about this project is that it's been student run from the very beginning. And on that day, you'll see, in that picture, you'll see a somewhat younger Mike Finn, uh, uh, as well as a number of other uh, students involved. It's been a, a really um, important aspect of the project for us from the start. But back to Giuseppe. Giuseppe gave a lecture on this day uh, about the Newland Phillips machine. And what he said was that we still need a machine that would help us visualize an economy whole. We still lack that. And one could imagine in the 21st century an updated version of the Newland Phillips machine, which didn't just represent the flow of money and taxation and savings, but also included the impact on the environment. Imagine such a machine. Imagine if when you looked at what an economy was, you weren't allowed to forget about the impacts on the environment of all of that activity. Imagine you could build a machine like that, and imagine that you began teaching students, training up the next generation, not just of economists, but of people who would work in the banks, so that whenever they thought economically, they always thought about their, uh, the environmental consequences. Could we do that? What would that be like? Uh, so there might yet be some mileage to be got, intellectually and even socially, out of the Newland Phillips machine. And this takes me finally to the uh, a, a point about the nature of models of us, models to do with, with humans. Uh, and now I can make this point, I think, by going back to Stephen's examples, uh, one of Stephen's examples. He gave the example of the uh, models of uh, atom behavior in the ideal gas law. Contrast that with ideas about banks. So to take the ideal gas law, I might have a theory. Maybe I have, maybe I subscribe to the classic uh, PV equals NRT, maybe I have uh, a heretical theory. Whatever my, my ideas about the relationship between pressure uh, and uh, volume in a gas, it's not going to affect the way that the gas behaves under pressure. It's quite indifferent to my thoughts about it. Banks are different. If enough of us come to believe that a bank is going to fail, then even if that bank is perfectly sound, through our activity of withdrawing money, the bank will fail. There's a much more intimate relationship between our ideas about the human world and what becomes true of the human world. Now, these are ideas that go back to Robert Merton, great sociologist of science, and by a weird coincidence, the father of the Merton, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, of the, uh, the Scholes black merton uh, equation that Stephen talked about. Uh, it was Robert Merton, in introducing this contrast pair, who introduced a phrase that you all know, the self-fulfilling prophecy. That's not a bit of English that goes all the way back. That's a bit of technical sociology of science uh, that Merton introduced to uh, label what happens in the bank situation. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, a prediction which becomes true because everybody believes it. Near our own day, the sociologist Donald McKenzie, based in Edinburgh, has, I think, been doing the most brilliant work in updating Merton's ideas on all of this for our time, studying finance theory and the ways in which theory models and reality have interacted in the curious ways they have. So to go back again to Stephen's example and, and the, uh, uh, the uh, assumptions that are built into the Black-Scholes option model, as Stephen pointed out, among other options, there is a model of the human, a vision of us as rational. And this brings me to that little game uh, that I asked you to play at the start. This is called the ultimatum game. Uh, take it or leave it. On the rational, self-interest maximizing model of the human, which is presupposed in classical economic theory, uh, what you should have offered the other person, of course, is 5P. 
because that would maximize your take. And they should have accepted it, because that way they get something rather than nothing. Uh, and I'm curious to find out over the course of uh, the discussion how far any of you actually did that. Uh, those who know this world more intimately than I do find that on the whole, nobody does that, except for students who've studied economics. <laughs> and as Stephen said, we know, sometimes the hard way, that people don't always act rationally. Uh, even within living memory, we've had uh, vivid examples of the learned being completely caught off guard by the way people actually behaved by compared with what all the rational analysis has said about how they ought to behave. And this leads me then finally, and I'll close here, to two ways, I think, of reading the legacies of the Newland Phillips machine. One is quite pessimistic. You might say, coming out of the 40s, we've had not just the, the growth of models in economics and the, the loss of understanding of just what assumptions are going in, a kind of blind faith to them, coupled with the growth in computing power. Uh, that can often lead to a sense that nowadays the economy is just out of control uh, and that we're all more or less victimized uh, by the algorithms that we initially built, but which have now moved uh, quite beyond our ability to, to shape them. That's a pessimistic reading, but there's another one, the one I favor, which is an optimistic one, which is that we build the models. And if we build them and change our world and change ourselves, we can rebuild them and build new models and, and change things. So I think whatever, whatever the case, whether uh, the pessimistic or the optimistic uh, reading, uh, the world will continue to spin, money to circulate around it, and along with them, money and maths and models. Thank you very much. <laughs>